Welcome back to Player Base. I'm GR, and in this, the exciting conclusion of our deep dive into the 1D&D &D playtest material analysis, um, after which I'm going to go get into a scrape with the sharks and then shake down the Power Rangers for their lunch money in school. But before that, let's go over uh, sort of a general impression of what WOTC is looking to do, what they're doing well, and what maybe generally people are not seeing in what they're trying to do, and also where they may be missing the mark. So the first thing is, you know, as I mentioned last video, very little of the material that they're presenting is at all actually really any different from fifth edition, except for the fact that they are basically canonizing in plain English common law either what people understood the rules were with things like critical fails and critical successes or uh, inspiration, or they're in plain English explaining what the rules are. And to the degree that they're doing the former, I commend them, and to the degree that they're doing the latter, I say do the former. And the reason for that is because people are already playing the game in the way that they understand it, and most of the time, the rules that they understand or misunderstand, they understand and misunderstand in the same way. And if that's working for people, leave it be. The other thing that they're doing is they've particleized all of the different rules that they have and made it explicitly clear to the audience, which is by far mostly made up of people who do not come from a basis or an a priori experience of analog tabletop role-playing games. 75% of the people who play Dungeons & Dragons are 35 years old or younger, which means that they were born in geez, was it 1987 or later, right? That means that, I mean, I don't watch a show, but at least some of the episodes of Stranger Things take place before the vast majority of the people who play D&D &D were even born. Just take that into consideration. So the experience, the preferences, the prejudices, the biases, the agility and the agency with the material that a lot of more experienced and older players have, you can't expect them to have. And one of those things is younger players do not know that you can do whatever you want. That the, first of all, the need for a consistent rule set across all dimensions was out of a particular type of play style where people would just take the same character and jump from room to room, which is not how people play now. And that also, everybody understood, and it was explicitly stated in a lot of places, that when you change things, you that's perfectly valid. And provided that people understand those changes ahead of time, there's really no reason to even worry about it. Generally speaking, in my own experience, particularly having to play with people who have never played before a lot, I don't change much because it's not like the juice isn't worth the squeeze, you know? I mean, I have a preference for the fact that because I know how they work, a sword is not a strength-based weapon and a bow is not a dexterity-based weapon. A bow is a strength-based weapon and a sword is a dexterity-based weapon. It's a whole other issue, and it's not worth even getting into here, and certainly not at the table where I'm trying to explain to people without them hyperventilating how to use a D20 or what DC is, right? So when they get into stuff like, here's how you make a half-racial character, right? Here's how you make a half-elf or a half-dwarf. People had already been doing that, but the people who had been doing it knew that they could do it. It's like... You know, when I found out you could drop out of school, I had already gone through high school. And I was really upset because I was like, uh, I didn't know you could, you could do that. It's not that it was 
I, I was against it or I looked my nose down at it. It just never occurred to me that just not showing up for school anymore was an option. I know that might be hard to believe when I'm dressed like, you know, if you're a jet, you're a jet. But we all have our proclivities and peculiarities, and as you might be able to tell, I've got some of my own. And the vast majority of D&D &D players ha share many of the same ones, and one of them is the fact that people just don't know that you can do what you want with the rules, and the rules are made implicitly and explicitly for you to break them up like that. So for them to spell that out more is the way forward. Now, where that comes into conflict with their own aims and goals is their third Titanic with their virtual tabletop. Now, the analysis of the strategy of digital delivery methods for Dungeons and Dragons material and price points and um, value assessments and dissemination and distribution is a whole other set of videos. And if people want, I will posit inferences and postulates on that ad infinitum. Just comment down below and uh, we'll talk about it. But for here, it's important to know that this is not the first time, in case you weren't aware, because um, this is a, a part of the push with 1D&D, &D, that Dungeons and Dragons and WotC as stewards of Dungeons and Dragons, have attempted to streamline a whole edition around a digital virtual tabletop or digital publishing. I mean, they've been doing it now for nearly 20 years. They tried to do it with fourth edition. There have been some attempts with fifth edition, and now they're trying it again. And as you might be able to infer, they have not been successful. And that's one of, one of the reasons people hate fourth edition. But it's not the only one, because you know it's built like a video game. And this comes into the same issue that 4th edition does, which is if you, let alone, and there's another issue that I'll get into about distribution and what we'll call farm teams in relation to the very unique and asymmetrical relationship Dungeons and & Dragons and WotC has with the tabletop economy, right? And that's, we're going to talk about that. But first, let's just talk about the fact that if you want people to understand that this is an imagination game where they can do whatever they want, having it be tied directly into a physical and finite and complicated computer program that is going to basically kill your business if you do it. And I realize that's bold to say, oh no. I was so emphatic I spit, how disgusting. I'm leaving that in, sorry. Um, but I mean, like I realize it's bold, but I, I'm willing to stand by it, and, and this is why. You know, one of the problems with D&D with &D Beyond and the way that they're doing things now is that there is an exclusionary element to it that is long-term detrimental to the business. And what do I mean by that? The people who play D&D are not all upper middle class. Most of them are white dudes. That's true, right? 75% of the people who play D&D are Caucasian men. So that's 40 out of the 50 million people. But they don't all have a couple grand worth of expendable income per season. And that's important because if you are going to make it de facto a requirement that people have a computer strong enough and reliable enough and powerful enough to run uh, an agile and working 3D imaging program like a virtual tabletop, you are going to cut a lot of people out. Now, the way that D&D works now is... And this is one of the problems that this is not going to solve. By design or by lack of design, you have one person who's the dungeon master who spends all the money and does all the work, which is one of the legitimate reasons people resent being a dungeon master. Because, I mean, I like not being able to have to get up and leave at 10 o'clock at night like it's just my house, right? And I have Italian, so I like hosting. But 
you know, for some people, the expenditure of like the coffee and the soda and the cookies and the crackers, um, even when players bring stuff, which isn't always a given, is more than they can bear without some real attention. And that's to say nothing of the cost of the materials to work from, right? Like, Player's Handbook is 50 bucks, the Dungeon Master's Guide is 50 bucks, and the monster manuals and the campaign supplements are all 50 bucks at least each, right? So let's say um, you're new at, at the game and you want to run Dragon King's Lost Minds of uh, the Yawning Portal, right? And you need to get the material. Now, not counting like the paper um, and if you're printing them out or you're buying them, the character sheets uh, and the pencils and the pens and the erasers and the sharpeners, you also have to get a Dungeon Master's Guide, a Player's Handbook, the campaign, and at least one monster mail. So that's $200. Now, for most of my career playing D&D, I spent a not inexhaustible amount of the time considering what I was going to play or how I was going to play based upon a $10 difference in the rule books. And you know, it's one of the reasons that because of scale, a lot of really good uh, role-playing systems don't do nearly as well. I mean, Delta Green, for instance, which is a uh, Lovecraftian, Cthulhu-style horror game set in like American military Vietnam era conflict. So you're like Delta Force in like 1972 in like Da Nang, and you know you come up against some kind of unspeakable horror. Like that's a gr oh my god, what a great game! Like the like the player's handbook is like. 70 or 60 bucks and the dungeon master's guide or whatever it's called is at least another 60 or 70 so just to get started in that game you have to spend a hundred dollars now with dungeons and dragons it's not that much cheaper but you have a pool of resources to work from right one person has the player's handbook one person has the dungeon master's guide you have the internet so yeah you can get most of the other stuff that you need right a lot of the Variants of character classes are either readily available or able to be piecemealed together with just information online. Which means that, you know, jumping over the barrier uh, to entry, which is to say it's a, it's a potentially hostile or at least scary and foreign social circumstance, and that's important, right? You know, not everybody is super outgoing. And just the idea of sitting down at someone else's table with people they don't know is already like, that costs a certain amount of like their limited resources of energy and focus and time and effort. And then on top of that, they have to learn the system, which is, pun it, interesting pun, witches, right? Because it's like arcane magic as described by a 12th century inquisitor monk in Eastern Poland. Like, it's not easily digestible the way that role-playing games work if you're not already familiar with it. It's intimidating, particularly if you want to do something punitive like being a magic user. I mean, I'll do a whole separate video on like the Vancean problem. But for this, that also is going to cost people energy and focus and time, right? And then on top of that, there is a component of financial output. Like the reason that things like bouldering, like rock climbing, uh, are relatively successful in as much as they are is that they are able to advertise like climbing gyms a uh, relatively cheap buy-in, right? Like you can go to a rock climbing gym or a bouldering gym and pay like five bucks and then rent a pair of shoes for like five or ten bucks. And then you don't really have to worry about the, you know, that barrier to entry and you can just focus on like, you know, how scary it is to climb up a rock or the social dynamic that you have to work through, or just the skills of like rock climbing. D&D has all that, and if you don't have the right people, it costs you like $100 to start. That's a lot for most people, right? And you know, one of the biggest problems with D&D with &D Beyond, at least before WotC bought it, was they were asking full price for material that you already owned. It's like, if I buy the player's handbook for 50 bucks, you would have to spend another $50 just to have access to it on D&D Beyond or 
um, Tasha's guide to extra stuff that you needed. You have to spend another $50. So you're spending $100 to use the same material to, for the convenience of playing online. And like the character creator is, 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 makes things easier, but first of all, most people learn the game by filling out that character sheet to begin with. And when you take that away from them, you take away their ability not only to understand the game and therefore to feel more comfortable and therefore more engaged and have a longer lifespan in participation, but also you take away their ability to present it and evangelize it to others. Because someone who's played 20 games of D&D but doesn't understand how to fill out a character sheet when they're trying to tell other people at their office or at their school or whatever um, that the game is fun and they can't explain basic stuff like that, that's a bad look for the game. Someone who's already intimidated is going to go, oh, I don't know. I mean, if you don't know, because it's like trigonometry. That, that's what most people are seeing when they see role-playing games, which is to say D&D, because that's the majority, like 55% of all tabletop role-playing games being played are D&D. So it's synonymous, effectively. And everyone who's not playing D&D knows what D&D is. So you're going to someone who's never played the game before and you say, hey, so you're going to sit down with a bunch of people who have a very particular niche interest uh, for like a whole evening, right, that involves you letting your guard down in a very particular psychological way. Um, and you have to learn a whole complicated set of like math and rules and terminology and it costs $50. What? So D&D Beyond already exacerbated that problem to a certain extent. But I mean, I don't know what kind of strategy they had. It, they negligized it to a certain degree. But if you're going to make the central economic model and engine dependent upon people engaging with a virtual tabletop that requires a certain level of buy-in, and maybe they're hoping that you know, we'll go to the cloud renting uh, market by that point, and so people will be able to just pay a subscription fee to use whatever like, you know, iPad they have to rent like a cloud-based um, high-end computer farm somewhere else for like 10 or $15 a month like Netflix, but for a PC, which is what people have been pushing for the last couple of years. However, I don't know that that's going to be in place soon enough and stable enough to really offset the fact that most people do not have the money to play this game in the way that it's suggesting it's going to be presented. Like, think Minecraft, right? Minecraft was built in 2008, 2009, okay? And... There are people who play the version of Minecraft, they play 1.7.10, which is the last one that the guy who created it really worked on. That was 2012, that was 10 years ago, right? It was a game that was made to be played on laptops at, like in the aughts. And people are playing the version from 10 years ago. Most popular video game ever, right? People still playing this version of the game, many, 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 many people. And a sizable portion of that population, of people who their central activity socially uh, and in terms of play is playing Minecraft, a 10-year-old version of Minecraft, struggle to be able to render it like past uh, like 16 chunks, which is, or even past eight, which is like not that much with like no shaders on. Let me, let me say that again. There is a huge portion of the Minecraft playing populace who do not have the equipment necessary to play the 10-year-old version of their game in any level of reflexive or agile uh, mechanical adaptability. So if you're going to grow the market share for this game, the model has to be one where you can get revenue out of people who do not have the ability to have access, let alone by themselves, a $2,000 gaming rig, which is what it's going to require. I mean, I'm filming this now on a $1,200 gaming rig, and like, you know, th there are some settings I have to sh I have to put down if I want to play. Like, I can't like I can't play Total War Warhammer 
at max settings if I want to see frame rates. And my system is better than most. So you're going to cut a lot of people out if that is the model. And that's assuming that the virtual tabletop works at all, which probably won't. You know, like this is the third time they've tried this, and their track record is not great. Uh, it's, um, I don't know. I, like, I don't want to naysay it, but I, they, there's a consistent track record of behavior here that cannot be denied. And on top of that, the whole issue with teaching millennials and Zoomers that they can do whatever they want with the game is completely negated if they have to work within the confines of the very limited abilities of what you can and can't do and what you can and can't visualize within a virtual tabletop. You know, one of the reasons, again, not the only one, that people hated 4th edition was because it absolutely required that you played in a distinctly tactical using minis on a battle grade manner. And not everyone plays like that. Not even people who play tactically play like that. I don't play like that. I don't play that. I have minis because, you know, of course I do. But it's a lot, particularly for people who are playing and they're already working out everything else. And when you're playing with what's referred to as theater of the mind because it's an imagination game, everybody gets to have their own version of it. And because they're thinking in their head with whatever imagination they have, they are thoroughly enthralled in the process in a way that they are not when they're looking at a screen. It's just not the same. And here's the thing, right? Like, if I fire up Warhammer, um, and I want to bother Bro, like when he's in his work day, uh, to play until the thing crashes, like the rendering of the game and the minutia of the mechanics are the vehicle for engagement. When I make a little phalanx of elves with my shield wall, and mechanically, because of the rule set, it blocks the other army from attacking my, my archery units or from progressing, and then I can hold off a choke point, I actually feel like an elven general like moving his little elves around on a battlefield fighting an ancient evil in an elven city. Like the actual mechanics and the specificity of those mechanics are necessarily requiring that type of visualization, and they're facilitated by that more than they would be on the tabletop. And on top of that, that is the vehicle for the narrative. I, I actually can feel like an elven general, or an orc general, or a pirate captain, or a vampire pirate captain, or, you know, like Emperor of China, all at the same time. And speaking of like we were at the issue with humans and also incorporating like animal and bird people, once again, White Dwarf does it better, right? Because you have, for whatever reason, particularly with traditional Warhammer, the ability to thematically incorporate the, like entire races of armies of like lizard people and then pirate vampires, and then elves, and then evil elves, and then androgynous um, Lovecraftian horrors, and then orcs, and then like fantasy Germans and fantasy British people, all pretty much working synergistically. And they don't have that for d, &D. Um, But also, uh, having a big complicated uh, computer engine to run stuff will not facilitate stuff, because you know, the one thing that tabletop gaming has that video games do not is that it's an imagination game and you can do whatever you can think of at the speed of thought. And until the AI singularity makes it so that you can do all that for free on your phone in 44 and a half months, D&D and role-playing games are the only game in town. Pun very much intended because D&D is most of the body of tabletop role-playing games. But that's the ace in the hole, and that's why, that's why fifth edition works so much better than fourth edition, because you know the the thing that really, really rubbed people the wrong way. And I'm speaking for myself, so maybe it's just anecdotal. Was it was like, hey, you like WoW? No. Okay, great. This is WoW, but you do all the computing work. It's like all the restrictions of a video game, but you have to do all the math by hand. No, thank you. And even if we were in a world where everybody had access to a machine that can run a virtual tabletop, which we are not and we will not be, 
and even if they had a virtual tabletop which absolutely ran and was easy to use, which they do not and they will not have, doing so would limit the chief ace in the hole for role-playing games, which is that you can just come up with anything. And you know, the one thing that they're really getting right in this is they're beginning to make inroads to teaching that to the younger generation, because that's the one thing that they can't get from their Steam library or from their uh, you know, game store on their phone or from the interface on their phone, which is all gamified. You know, good luck finding somebody who codes for a living who doesn't have some influence of Dungeons and Dragons in the way that they do things. Like, it, it runs the world, you know? It, Revenge of the Nerds was like 40 years ago, and we've been living in that world ever since. So that's just a mistake. And it, bold of me to say, but a statement I stand by. The other thing that's a real problem is that because WotC and Dungeons and Dragons is the majority of the entire field of this genre, over 50% of the people who play role-playing games with paper and pens and pencils play D&D and 5th edition D&D, they don't have the same relationship with their competition. You know, other, other game studios that produce role-playing games like Fantasy Flight Games, which is now being hamstrung by SMT, or um, you know, Warhammer, or Call of Cthulhu, like, or the Free League Games, any one of those publishers, or to say nothing of the like, myriad smaller individual publishers, they aren't D&D's competition. Those are their farm teams. And I'll give you an example. If you think of, if you like, just think of, or bother to look at, who is working at WOTC now who wasn't working there before 2010? How many people who have been hired at WOTC in the last 10 years didn't come out of some ancillary industry? How many people working on Dungeons and Dragons, either in the central office or participating in many of their licensed products, aren't working on their competitors' products, right? Like, take critical role. Look at the, you know, the, the byline for any of the Critical Role 5th edition or the Penny Arcade 5th edition official rule book uh, masthead, and every single one of those names that isn't working at WOTC is working principally at their competitors. And this is important. This is uh, like the relationship between uh, WOTC and the other people who build tabletop role-playing games for a living or design the material or craft the material is the relationship between a large popular game like the like Total War franchise or like Minecraft or you know like earlier versions of Halo or like Doom and Quake that they have to their modding community, right? People who are successful at modding like a Fallout game or like the guy, like one of the really early big popular mods from Minecraft was the Aether, which was like the heaven dimension. It, it, he made a dimension that was more like what they thought the end, were expecting the end to be like than anybody else. They hired that guy. I don't know what they've had him do, but, because they haven't put out the Aether. But like that's the relationship that Watsi has to other tabletop game developers. And if there isn't a vibrant marketplace and economy for those people to make a living and hone their craft, then the quality of Watsi's material will go down precipitously because the people who work at Watsi are the people who do that stuff the best because they have the ability to choose those people. And those people are the best because they have an entire environment where they can build up their skills while paying their rent. And if you cut them all out, or if you cut them out prohibitively with um, whatever like closed economy loop that you d decide to design for your virtual tabletop, it's going to kill any potential for further development of Dungeons and & Dragons and Wizards of the Coast to begin with because people will not be able to feed themselves long enough to develop the skills necessary to contribute positively 
to Wizards of the Coast. And they know that better than I do. But it bears repeating because it's worthwhile. And like the thing about the singularity, like that's not really a joke. <laughs> it's funny, but you know, there's 44 and some change months between now and when basically any manufactured item you pick up will be able to calculate you know, the entire mass of the universe within you know, a couple of ounces as fast as you can ask the question. And until that point, like, WotC has a real corner on the imagination game market. But they can strangle themselves to death because D&D has done that before. That's how WotC got the, the, the property to begin with. TSR could not manage the system um, without shooting themselves in the foot for a variety of reasons. A lot of it had to do with the fact that they didn't know how to run a business, but it's not the only reason. Because part of the issue uh, with TSR was that they didn't understand, and this was true in the 80s and the 90s in general, um, I mean, White Dwarf and, and like Games Workshop and Warhammer still have this vestigial legacy of you know, having a kind of a punitive relationship with the uh, <laughs> economy and marketplace of the people who are buying their product. Um, and thankfully, most people playing D&D, most Zoomers and, and Millennials aren't aware of that. It would be great. I would love to keep it that way. Um, yeah, I think we are like, yeah, we're good. I mean, unless there's something that I missed that I should have said, but that I didn't say. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, like, comment, subscribe, uh, share this with your friends, with your enemies, with your frenemies. And if there is something that you want me to talk about that I almost talked about but didn't, I'll leave a comment. And let me know, and I will read them. Thank you so much. I'm GR. This has been PlayerBase. Thank you for listening to us talk about Ludology. Ciao, 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 ciao.